Good morning. But is it really? It was wet outside. It was raining. But it's not cold. So maybe it is a good morning. If you, dep- if you depend on the weather to decide whether it's a good morning or not, I want to introduce you to this man named Jesus. Um, he will make your life brighter, literally. Uh, <clears throat> so, I don't know, some of you might not have been here. The very first Christmas that Jeanette and I were here, and I preached a message, and I kind of ruined everybody's everybody's Christmas that year because I told you that Mary and Joseph were not alone in a manger out in the middle of nowhere. How many people remember that? Um, Unfortunately, I might ruin some of your guys' Christmas again. It's not as severe as that, but we're going to be talking about something today that I think some people misunderstand around Christmas time. Um, We're going to get to that. But there's a phrase, we're still, we're still doing our, um, our investigating the truth, and if you look at the title of the message this morning, it's called True False, and we've looked at some statements up to this point that have been kind of controversial. Um, today I want to look at a statement that I think most of you will agree with me on, and that is the statement that I've heard a lot of people say, and that is... Just follow your heart, right? Just follow your heart. Um, <clears throat> thank you. That that statement is 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 said a lot, and I think what do they mean by that? Literally, what do they mean by that? Because. It, they're not talking about your physical heart, right? Because you can't follow your physical heart. If you tried following your physical heart, you wouldn't go anywhere. Because your heart doesn't go anywhere unless you take it. So obviously that means. So they don't mean that. So what do they mean by follow your heart? Follow your emotions? Yes, because our emotions never lie to us. Every time you have an emotion it is 100% correct. That's not true. Um, Does it mean follow your desire? Does it mean follow what makes you happy? Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can really know how bad it is? So let me just throw this out there. Don't follow your heart. It will, it's deceptive, and it'll lie to you, and it'll lead you where you don't want to go, and you don't know how bad it really is. So if we're not going to follow our heart, what are we going to follow? By the way, you like my, um, like my Christmas shirt? Yep. I was told by somebody, and just to uh, not embarrass them or anything, I think it's the same person that gave me this shirt, that I was a Grinch, And that this person felt sad for me. I'm a Grinch, and this person feels sad for me. Um, You know what? I I don't feel sad for myself, so I'm not sure what the whole issue is. But um, I just told them that I would wear this shirt today. So here you go. This is my Merry Grinchmas shirt. I don't know why I did that, but I just felt I needed to. So if we're not going to follow our heart, what do we follow? I think we can take a lesson from a, uh, a Christmas story. Um, I remember when I first started, remember singing this song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, Bearing Gifts We t- Not Travel. If you said travel, you need to go back to Sunday school. Traverse afar. Um, <clears throat> There is so many things wrong with that song, I don't know where to begin. We're going to talk about following the star. And we're going to look at this story, Matthew chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> it's the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to look and see what we can learn 
from these, these wise men, as they are called, these kings. So, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, if you don't, it'll be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 2, um, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. Jesus, I'm going to read all 12 verses, and then we're going to come back and take a look at it. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone else in Jerusalem. He called a meeting as a uh, leading priest and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the first star appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. <coughs> Just thought I'd let you know that he was not wanting to go worship him. After the interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they, uh, the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their homeland by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod, because he was a liar. Okay, that last part's not in there. But he, he was lying. <coughs> so I, I want to look at this story, and there's a couple of things. I don't want to talk about following a star because that would be uh, astrology, um, and we're not, I'm not really into astrology because uh, a lot of it's made up. Um, <coughs> but I think the, 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 the magi, I'm going to call them magi, and I'm going to try and remember to call them magi because we're going to talk about the magi in a minute. Um, I want to look at, at what they did and how it can relate to what we should do, okay? Um, we know that um, there was something special that happened, and it piqued their interest, and it was a star, right? Um, they, they saw this star. These magi saw these stars. And it caused them to do something. But what was this star? Now, I've heard a lot of theories. I've read a lot, uh, not just preparing for this, this message, but uh, in, in, me in messages past where I've talked about this. And there are a lot of common thoughts. Some of them are, are really weird, and I don't want to get into those. But the, the three most common, <coughs> excuse me, the three most common ideas <coughs> is that it was a comet, <coughs> um, <coughs> is that it was a nova or a supernova, or that it was um, the birth of a star that was just beginning to become a star. Uh <coughs> I don't want to go into all of these for the lack, for, because I, have, I don't have enough time to actually do all that. This is to say, none of those, according to a um, astronomy, now remember, astronomy is not astrology. So make sure you understand that I'm not saying astronomy, I'm saying astrology. Okay? Uh, <coughs> astronomy uh, says that those things are measurable even in today's society. Meaning that if it was the birth of a star or a supernova, <coughs> we would know today there would, be, there would be something in outer space that would tell us that those things have happened even today. <coughs> so they've kind of eliminated those as possibilities. Comet. <coughs> the problem with a, with a comet is that <coughs> it would not have done the things that the Bible says that it should have done 
that was leading the people to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. Because they went to Jerusalem first, and then the star led them to Bethlehem, which we'll get to in a minute. So what would it, what would it be? If, if it's not those things, the most likely thing that it could be, and all of this, with our technology, all of this is measurable. And that is the alignment of the planets and stars that are existing in space today. And so people who really believe that this happened, that, the, that this star really was brighter than all the other stars, and, and believed that it signified something, believed that it was an alignment of a couple of planets. And they can go back and they can tell you exactly what day, April 17th of the year 6, was an alignment of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, um, the moon, and another star called, I believe it was Rigus or something like that. And the alignment of those created a bright star that the, that the Magi could follow. And the alignment of those could have even lasted several days. But there's one small problem with this. It took them longer than several days to go from where they were to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. And then it said that the star rested over the place where Mary and Joseph were. Have you ever saw a star rest over any particular place? My, my proposition, and this is, this is the one I choose, to, uh, uh, I choose to believe, is that God can do whatever he wants. And so if he wanted to put a star over a house, he'd put a star over the house. It'd have to be a really, really tiny, tiny star. But he could do it. Um, sometimes we try and find physical explanations in physics to explain things that are unexplainable. A day standing still. A Red Sea parting. The... Um, uh, Jordan River, at flood stage, stopped flowing. And we can give explanation as to why we believe, the, the, how physics could explain it. Sometimes it's just God doing a miracle. That's all it is. And we take it at face value. Now, could God have chosen to line up these planets for that specific purpose? Absolutely. Could he have known that if, when the planets lined up, that's when his son was going to be born. He could have planned it all out in advance. But we don't have to always have a, 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 a physical explanation for how God does things. That's, to, that's not to mean that we don't try and find out if there is a, a physical explanation, but we don't have to have one. And I think that's what we see here. The first thing that we find out about these, these magi is that they recognized the star for what it was. They recognized the star for what it was. Now, <coughs> as, if you know the story, these men, these magi, came from the east. And the east is east of where the land of Israel was. Uh, in fact, they, they believe it was on the other side, if, not, if Babylon, Persia, over that way, even further than that, because uh, the song, as the song goes, from Orient R. They, some, I mean, when I first saw that, or, from, from Orient R, so I thought, well, they're Oriental then. If they're from the Orient, would well, we think they were Oriental? So why didn't we have a bunch of little... Chinese guys, none of, none, of the, none of the magi riding donkeys in our nativity scene are Chinese. This is the way I thought when I was in high school. 
<coughs> and now you know what's my, what my, that I have a problem. <laughs> but they recognized the star was what it was. We find out as you read the story that that star was representing the coming of the Messiah. I'm going to associate the star and the magi with us and Jesus. We can learn a lot. They recognized the star for what it was, a sign to lead them to the Messiah. My question I, I have to ask is, do we recognize who Jesus is? <clears throat> do we recognize that Jesus is the one that can lead us to God? Do we recognize that? Sure, we say we do. And sure, we'll, we'll, we'll even believe it on the surface. But I'm going to read these because as I was contemplating this question, some, some, some statements came to mind, and I, <clears throat> and I wanted to get them down because I didn't want to, to missay them. The fact that some Christians will spend more money on Christmas gifts this year than what they gave to God over the last year in the form of tithes and offerings is proof that they don't fully recognize who Jesus is. The, the fact that we view our workplace as a moneymaker more than a mission field is proof that we don't fully recognize who Jesus is. The fact that there are more people who view church as an optional and just a place to go is proof that they don't fully recognize who Jesus is. The fact that people earnestly seek forgiveness from God through Jesus' blood but are unwilling to forgive others is proof that we don't fully recognize who Jesus is. The fact that we are willing to say negative and me things about people and yet worship God with the same mouth is proof that we don't fully recognize who Jesus is. They recognize, these magi recognize the star for what it is, a sign of something amazing, something spectacular. Uh, <coughs> the, the birth of the Messiah, or at the very least, the coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> and so, they decided to act upon that. Is our life reflective of recognizing who Jesus is? Or is it just, we'll say polite words, we'll go to church every once in a while, um, and we'll even ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, but don't ask any more of us. The next thing that's interesting that happens is after they recognize the star, the, the star up there, you know what they decided to do? Follow the star. They didn't just point and say, oh, that's a lovely star. And you know what? I think I know what that star means. I think that means that the... Uh, that, that the Messiah, the, then the Jewish Messiah is coming, and hey, that's pleasant. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing later on today? You want to go golfing? No, they looked, they studied, they said, and again, <clears throat> understand these three individuals were not. In 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 most of you probably already know, they were not kings. Okay, you know why we say they are kings. We say they're kings for a couple of reasons. One is because of their gifts. Okay? Uh, another is because we perceive them as wearing these wonderful garments. Right? How many of you have a nativity scene where they're dressed out in beautiful garments? Where is that in the Bible story? Could somebody point it out for me? No. No. We put them in those garments. Why? Because we believe they're kings. Why do we believe they're kings? Because they're in garments. It's circular reasoning. And by the way, circular reasoning is, is non-believers' 
great use of why the earth is billions of years old. But we won't go into that. The word there for wise men is magi, or magios. Um, <clears throat> it's the Greek word there. And it is only used, believe it or not, six times in the Bible, in the New Testament. Okay? Four of those six times it is used in this story. Two other times... It is used in Acts chapter 13. I'm going to go read Acts chapter 13, verses 6 and 8. And I want you to tell me if you can figure out what word in, in this passage is, is translated from Magi. After they traveled from town to town across the entire land until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attacked him, attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Where in the world do you read wise men in that passage? Or kings, for that matter? No. Do you know what is trans... What the, what Magi is translated into sorcerer. What? Okay, wait a minute. Sorcerer, wise men, kings. I don't, uh, you know what? Can anybody else tell me the Bible's confusing? Because I just tell you, sometimes I am flabbergasted. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the thing. In the research that I did, the thing that, that sticks out most, um, and if you go to certain dictionaries, most dictionaries, you will actually find under the word uh, magi, the, the, the Greek word magios, you will find um, wise men there. You will find astrologers there. You will find even sorcerers there. But who were they? Who really were they? The only thing we have to go on is what the text says. And we can, we, there are certain things that we know for sure. But before we get there, I, wanted to, I want to share three things that we, that we believe that are probably false. The first one is you all, you've heard me say this, you probably know this too. Chances are there were not just three men. We, you know why we say three? Go ahead, somebody tell me. There were three gifts. Makes sense. Well, three gifts, three men. Hey, makes sense. Um, <clears throat> let me burst your bubble. Uh, unitivity is wrong. Okay? Because you have a nativity scene. Even if timing in your nativity scene is correct. So if you have, you know, the, the, you have the Jesus and all of this, uh, the, the, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds all here, right here. And even if you, because the, 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 the Magi didn't show up right away, even if you have the Magi way over here, so in our house, in our house, Jesus would have to be in the basement and the Magi would have to be in the, in, in the, in the upstairs. That's how far away they'd have to be. Okay? Even if, you, even if you did that, the fact that you only had three people on three camels is wrong. And here's why. These were very wealthy men. Most likely, they were uh, from a royal court. How many people of royalty or who are associated with royalty would travel alone with expensive gifts from wherever they were from, the east, all the way to, to Jerusalem and into Bethlehem. No, they probably had a huge entourage of people traveling with them. They probably had uh, military support. Chances are it wasn't just these three guys on camelback traveling out in the middle of nowhere with expensive gifts that they want to give to robbers. Probably a whole group of people. But most of those people don't matter. 
The people that matter are the Magi because they're the ones who are making this trip. Here's another interesting fact about this is that <coughs> they, they probably weren't Jews. So how would they even know that the Messiah is being born and this, 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 this star is, is representing the birth of the Messiah? Chances are it had to do with the captivity, and I don't want to go into all that. But they did a little bit of, they saw this star, and it made them start thinking not just of what it meant, but they had to actually do some research to figure out what really is going on here. So they talked to their Jewish friends who probably were still living somewhere in the east after the captivity, and they said, hey, this is what it means. And so they go, oh, let's go and let's give them some gifts. They weren't just three of them, although there may have just been three magi, no telling. We don't really know. Could, could not have been. But chances are they were not just three individuals traveling together. <coughs> and chances are they were not kings, although they may have been from a royal court. What do we know for sure? We know that they traversed afar. We don't know how far. We know that... They believed this sign, this star, they believed that this star was a sign of the coming Messiah. It says so in the text. We know that they had expensive gifts. We know that their questions about the star and the Messiah did not fall on deaf ears. I was reading a, one author, and he, um, he made mention that they must have been kings because they had the ear of Herod. And Herod would not give anybody any time if they weren't important. And so he, he came to the conclusion that they were kings. I have a different theory. I have a different theory. Now, I am not a scholar by any means, okay? So don't, but I have a different theory. And, and it comes from, from reading the text. And it says this, <clears throat> Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, magi, from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Up to this point, all we know is that they're asking these questions. So, Envision this. We're in Shenandoah. And all of a sudden, you see this big caravan coming in of a large group of people. And they start asking questions about when somebody important was born. How long ago were they born? It was recent. How long ago? How fast do you think word would get around? Probably pretty fast. Hey, did you see? Did you did you see this group of people that just came into town? They're kind of weird, aren't they? That's my first comment about people. Is they're they're kind of weird. <clears throat> hey, don't don't laugh, don't laugh because weird people can call weird people weird. If you're not weird, you can't call weird people weird. Right. <clears throat> this 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 large group. Three magi, however many there were, but their whole entourage comes into town. They're, they're causing a big ruckus, asking a bunch of questions about the Messiah, trying to get an answer. King Herod, listen to this, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, when he heard that these people were asking these questions. And this is when, and it, not only he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. So everybody heard that he were asking these questions, and they were disturbed. <clears throat> and then, after Herod heard all of this, then it says, he called a meeting with the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? So up until this point, we don't, we don't read any meaning, meeting between the Magi and Herod. 
which leads me to believe that everything Herod was hearing up to this point was secondhand. So he calls in his, his, um, he calls in his religious leaders and he says, hey, dude, where is this guy supposed to be born? Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? Because I want to worship him. Liar. <clears throat> so Herod finally calls a meeting, a private meeting with the wise men, uh, the magi. And um, he, he encourages them to go and find out where this, this Messiah is to be born and come back and tell me because I want to kill him. I mean, I want to worship him, liar. Their, their search for the Messiah that was brought on by the star did not fall on deaf ears. Because they were asking everybody. And there was a whole slew of them. People began to notice. Unfortunately, our relationship with Jesus is a lot less, we're a lot less vocal about that, unfortunately. We like to consider ourselves as secret agents for Jesus. Shh, don't tell anybody. We don't want anybody to know. The last thing that that um, this this star did that that caused them is their belief that this star truly represented the Messiah led them into action. What do our belief about Jesus? What does it lead us to do? What does it lead us to do? Uh, get up and go to church on a regular basis. Although we'll use the word regular pretty uh, <clears throat> loosely. Uh, people have a misunderstanding of what regular means. Regular doesn't mean every Sunday. It just means on a regular basis. You could come to church every Christmas and every Easter and come on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean it's frequent. It just means it's regular. Does your belief in who Jesus is lead you to be obedient? As long as it's not inconvenient. I'll be obedient, but if it's going to put me out, I love you, Jesus. But, you know what that but means? I don't love you wholeheartedly, Jesus. That's what that but means. So anytime you say, I love you, Jesus, but, you know what you're telling him? I love you, Jesus, with half of my heart. I know we don't want to admit that, but. <laughs> so you have these, these magi, um, wise men, sorcerers, probably not kings. And, and they see this star, and they recognize it for what it is. Then they, they are so moved that it causes them to take action. And then we see the last thing that we can learn from them. And then there's one thing we don't want to copy them in. And we're going to get to that. But the, 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 we, we see the thing that they do is that when they finally reach the place, the star was leading them. They worshipped with gifts. They worshipped with gifts. It is the gift. It is the year. Or the year. It is the season of giving. Right? Everybody, um, everybody loves to receive gifts. Eli, um, we've gone to a couple of Christmas parties, and and his his statement is something like this. Man, I can't wait till they see what I see what they're gonna get me. Well, Eli, you bought them gifts too. Yeah, but I can't wait to see what they're gonna get me. Um, <clears throat> that's 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 uh, sometimes our mentality, uh, <coughs> and we need to learn to we need to. Be, 
But really, what, what is a great gift? What is a great gift? Okay, hey, a new cell phone, a new car, a new house, your own private island in the South Pacific. If you're not into the ocean, maybe your own private mi- mountain in Colorado. How about that? I know some of you would rather be there anyway. Um, you know, there's actually a, there's actually a, a, a gift that I think Jesus wants uh, that would be better. He, he wants us to worship, but there's more to that. And, and this gift is something that the Magi didn't do. Because we read at the end of the story, and I'll go back there. At the end of the story, it says this. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. You know what we don't read about in the scripture? We don't read about them doing anything else. We never hear them again. They went home. They did it. They did what they were supposed to do. They brought gifts. Yay, they celebrated the Messiah. Okay, let's go home and go back to our lives. Sometimes I fear that's how we are with God. That's how we are with Jesus. When, when it's time to celebrate Jesus, when something significant happens, something great happens, we celebrate Jesus and we give him a few gifts. And then we go about our daily lives again until there's this significant thing that happens. And unfortunately for some people, that significant thing may even be church. I went to church. It was great. It was awesome. I worshiped God. It was wonderful. I couldn't have, it was, that was such the powerful service. Monday morning. Okay, let's go to work. Do our own thing. I, I gave, Jesus, I gave you your gift on Sunday. Hope you enjoy it. I'll be back next Sunday to give you another one. There's, there's one gift, I think, that Jesus wants us to give that no amount of money can ever buy. There's a gift that no relationship could ever provide. And it's a gift that each person and every person can give if they choose to. Not that it's going to be easy. And that gift is your unending devotion. Your unending devotion. The Magi went back to their, to their land, to the east, wherever they were living, and maybe they continued to worship God. I don't know. We don't, we don't read anything about it. But I fear that sometimes we, we put our relationship with Jesus and God in that same place. We think this one-time gift is fine, but what really God wants is our everlasting devotion. And I, I purposefully did not use the word everlasting love because Sometimes we use that word and kind of like follow your heart. We use that word and we just don't, we don't put definition to it. What God wants, what Jesus wants, is your unending devotion. Which means when you get up on Sunday morning, go to church, whether you feel like it or not. You come in here. You raise your hands in worship, you sing in worship, whether you feel like it or not. When you go to work, 
and your, your, your co-worker is hurting, you share the love with Jesus with them, whether you feel like it or not. When God says, I want you to give this, you give it, whether you feel like it or not. Unending devotion. As I, as I close this, this time of the service, and we're going we're gonna to move into more of a Christmas, really Christmas-oriented time, I want, <coughs> I want you to ask yourself, what ways, and this is something everybody can, everybody can relate to, in what ways can you better your devotion to God? What area of life, what area of life can you say, you know, I have not been completely devoted in this area of my life. I'm going to close in prayer, and as I do, I want you to um, <coughs> I want you to talk with God. And if you don't know of an area, ask Him. Say, God, okay, what area do you want? Do I need to really work on? And if God doesn't answer you, I'm sure your friends could help you out with that. They're good at that. But if you're listening, God will show you. He's smarter than your friends are anyway. So talk with God and find out. And let God work on your heart. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We just ask right now that you would move in our hearts. You would speak to us. Lord, we've, we've committed our life to you. But have we really committed all of our life? Have we committed our unending devotion? We fail. Lord God, and if there's anybody here who truly desires, who truly desires to change those aspects in which they're failing at, show them. Give them strength. Give them courage. Give them power to grow in you. We love you. We thank you for that. We ask it in your name. Amen. So we're going to do... <coughs>